Welcome to One Insight. My name is Rich Litvin. I grew up in London and I now live in LA. And this is a podcast for extraordinary top performers and their coaches. You see, I've coached some of the most successful and talented people on the planet. I can see what most people cannot see. And I dare to say what most people wouldn't dare to say. And what I know about success is that on the other side of it, it can be incredibly lonely. You can feel more of an imposter the more successful you become. And when you're the most interesting person in the room, you're actually in the wrong room. Clients who are more successful, more intelligent and wealthier than you need your support more than they know and more than you can imagine. I coach around insight. Life looks one way, something happens and the world looks different and your entire world changes. It can happen in an instant. And this podcast is called One Insight because a single insight can change everything. This is your first time. This, uh, this little uh, web series is called Might Help, Can't Hurt, Conversations with Leaders, Doers, and Friends. And this is episode three. And my uh, leader, doer, friend, guest uh, this time around is Rich Litvin. Hey, hello. Hey, Michael. Hey. Uh, and uh, you can find Rich at uh, it's richlitvin.com. Thank you. Simple. Yeah. Simple like that. There you go. <laughs> so you find out more about Rich there. But Rich, I was trying to remember when did we first meet? Was it 2007? Because that's what I put in the little blurb, and then I realized I might be making that up. No, no, 2007. Yeah. So, so how did how did we do that? Well, you know, I ask myself that question sometimes because I was, if not your first apprentice, one of the first apprentices. I think maybe Elise was your first, and I was your second. Something. Yes, like that. you were in the you were in the first three. I remember that. And um, I spoke to you once, and then signed up as your apprentice. But I've reflected on back over the years. Like, how did I do that? Why would I send fifty grand to a man I spoke to once? And I realized, well, I've been listening to your radio show for a year or two before that. Right. So I felt like I knew you. Yeah. And and now it still feels like I know. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's still true. You knew me the first time, you still do. Yeah. Uh now, but you've 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 gone on to um well to do great things. I mean, you 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 are sort of a uh I don't know what you call yourself, but I I would call you like a a a leader's coach. Um and, and that was sort of where I thought it might be fun to jump in. Mm. Uh just by the way, for anyone who's new to this, we just talk and you guys get to listen in and we may, if you got any question, you can put it in and we may get to it. We may not. We're just chatting. Have fun. Uh, but, but essentially, how have you been, like, what is the role of a leader right now? Like, what mm-hmm. is it to be a leader in, a, in, a, in an unprecedented time? Because this is, I think we can safely say, unprecedented. Yep. We weren't around when the hundred years ago when we had uh, uh, Spanish flu. So pretty much, <laughs> yeah. um, I, I'd I'd say times of crisis are amplifiers. If you're a great leader, you step into leadership, and you're an even greater leader in times of crisis. And if you're a crappy leader, it amplifies all of your weaknesses. Right, and that's what's happening right now. And we're seeing this in corporate. I've got lots of clients who are high level in corporate, and those leaders who micromanage. Um, even more micromanagers right now. Right. And the leaders who are great leaders are stepping into leadership and they're letting their people fly. And, and so, so if, if I wasn't already a great leader coming in, am I screwed? Like, am I just doomed to be amplified? All my crap be amplified? And, like, or is there... Is uh, let me there put it this way. It, it, unless you have some level of consciousness, <laughs> there's a level of, uh, oh, I wouldn't yeah. say screwedness. But, so but you know, I, I mean, I've always thought the biggest key for leadership, the biggest secret to leadership is, is self-awareness. And, and most leaders don't have much. Mm-hmm. So there's not much you can do to support a leader who's not willing to look on the inside. Right. But if you're a leader who has self-awareness and you can see, oh, yeah, this is where I'm slipping into my old patterns, then you have, a, you have choice in that moment. There's opportunities there for you. Right. Right. And how have you found it? Like you, cause you've got the kids at home. Like how old are they now? I, f- I hate that. Six, I don't six and eight. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you were there when my first born. Yeah. Was- I remember. Um, cause that must be a little bit different, uh, life having everybody at home. Yeah. So, so 
you know, I have two brothers, um, Andy, who's who you've spent time with, and yeah. Peter. Peter is a year younger than me. He's got kids who are 15 and 18. Andy's just had a little baby, by the way. You may not know oh that. Oh, my God. I didn't know. Oh, congratulations. So, yeah. He's got a little baby called Fergus. His wife nice. is Irish. Um, and so we have this whole uh, range of uh, age of kids. And Peter's been sympathizing with both of us because, uh, I mean, Andy's going through everything you go through when you have a newborn in the house. Yeah. I have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. I, I was a high school teacher. I taught in inner city London. I taught some of the most challenging kids out there. But it doesn't, <laughs> they don't hold a candle to my kids because coaching or teaching. Your own kids. I was in the war, damn it. It's still not enough. <laughs> so it's, it's, been, it's been challenging. Uh, today I had a, here, I'll make it real for you. I, I was, uh, give Monique some space. I was homeschooling this morning. We had two hours. They were really doing some great stuff. I said, guys, go and have a little break. Um, I'll get something ready for you. I took a break because I was just a bit wiped. It's, it takes a lot of energy. Yeah. And suddenly I hear crying from the backyard and I come out. Ellington is soaking wet. Kaleo's pushed him into the little paddling pool that we have. It's not, it's not a proper swimming pool. It's one of those plastic ones. But, um, and um, they've had this massive fight. And then I get them all calm and I discover, because Ellington confesses to me that he took one of Kaleo's toys when he was really angry because he'd been soaked and threw it on the roof of our house. So we have to break the news to Kaleo, who now is crying his heart out. <laughs> And all I want to do is get them back to work so I can get back into my work. And so that was my morning. There you go. Oh, very nice. Ni Ni Nina, we, we have all have fond memories of the kids playing drowning. What are you doing? We're playing drowning. <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> you know? um, I, I'm glad my kids haven't heard that game yet. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it, and it's exhausting. That, that, you know, I, I talk about zone of genius. Uh, when you're in your zone of genius, I can be doing this stuff all day long, coaching my clients. Um, it, it's, it makes me come alive when I'm with my kids or doing something that, that is not my strength, it really tires me out. And so I've, I've built a life and a business doing those handful of things that only I can do. And I get energized and feel alive, but now I'm doing all sorts of other things. Yeah. Um, look, now, I'm, I'm, have you found genius has expanded? Cause that, that's sort of one of the things that I've seen is when I, at first, when I tried to play outside my zone of genius, I struggled. But then at a certain point, I realized, oh, it's kind of all the zone of genius because it's it's showing up from genius. That's a nice distinction, actually. Yeah. I mean, if I'm I'm in the early days of playing in new ways, but I can see already a few days into homeschooling, I'm getting new ways to play with it. I mean, until they had this disaster, we had two hours of two little kids working their heart. Ellington was, Dad, my back is hurting so much because I'm enjoying the drawing, is what he said. It was a beautiful oh, moment. So uh, I, let's, let me not call it my zone of genius. <laughs> no, but one of one of my god kids was. He's a tennis player. And he's been. He's twelve now. Just turned twelve, and and he's working out because they're training him to for the U.S. Olympic team. I mean, he's not there yet, but like he's on the early radar. And he said, "Dad, I I worked out. I I I worked out so hard. My arms are so tired. I can barely walk." Huh, nice. Yeah, I thought that was pretty good. So what what are you finding your clients are, are struggling with most and what are they like thriving on? Because it's got to be a bit of both. Well, it is actually, I didn't know you were going to ask the second question. So my answer was going to be actually some of them are struggling with guilt because they're thriving and their businesses are thriving. So that's been really interesting to see people who are actually in, in a place where they're doing really well. Um, I've got... Um, clients of clients so some of my clients one of the things i've been doing th the last three or four weeks is serving two layers deep so i've been saying to each of my clients tell me one at a time about each of your clients or or, or customers right what's their biggest challenge what's their biggest dream right now and let's work with them and so as uh, we've been diving down there and helping their clients and their customers so we've seen a range of things from people in the restaurant industry high-end restaurants that have pivoted and are now doing takeout with expensive steaks and things that you can yeah. drive up and pick up. Uh, uh, one of my clients right now, uh, she has a, a, a client who runs a ski, um, what do you call it? Ski slope. I'm not a skier. So uh, <laughs> we know what you mean. Gotcha. So um, <laughs> they're, they're working at, well, what can we do? Because we're, it's not legally allowed for us to have anyone on site right now. And we were playing with, well, what ideas can we give you that so that, you could be actually building a community right now. Mm. How can you actually be making money? You could, what, what, what sort of offers could you make to people now? Cause people are going to want to come back to skiing in a few weeks time, whenever we open up, 
what offers can you make to them now? If you sign up now, you put your money down now, you help us and we can help you. And so it's been really fun to play with these sort of ideas, uh, helping people, like I say, two layers deep. Uh, I like that. I like that a lot. It, 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 uh, I like both parts of it, actually. I like the two layers deep, but I also mm-hmm. like the looking at creative ways of financing. I remember the first time I came across that, there was my uh, uncle and aunt lived in a, by a ski area in Vermont, mm-hmm. uh, near Bromley. And there was a bakery in their town called Baba Louie, mm-hmm. and they, were, they wanted to expand. And, and they, they couldn't figure out how to do it. And I don't know where the idea came from, but they sold bread shares, they called them. So it was like you could buy so much bread in advance as an investment in their expansion to and they they open up in another time. It was fantastic. It's a beautiful idea. Yeah, that, that kind of thinking right now is what's yeah. needed. And so I'm really playing with my clients and like I say, their clients and their customers thinking differently. Yeah. Yeah. How you doing, man? It's been a while since I've seen you. I'm... I'm surprisingly well and i say surprisingly not so much because of what's going on because you know for better and for worse I'm, I'm not directly affected you know we have one person directly in our world ill and you know there's stuff going on but but i think the big thing for 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 me has just been trying to find a new off switch mm. because i could literally be doing this 24 7 right now i have not just people requesting me to come and do this and do that and talk about this and talk about that, but I've got so many ideas. I was, I was saying to Rich before we came on, my daughter is making me slow down and not do one of these every day or even two a day. Cause I really like these conversations and I've been, and they, you know, you know the, I think they're really rich and I think they're really helpful to people right now. Yeah. So for me, it, it literally has been kind of reminding myself, Hey, you don't have to, just cause you can, doesn't mean you have to. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that one. Yeah. So it's like a little bit of enthusiasm and a little bit of guilt. Like you said, it's, it's, it's like, man, I love this and man, I should be helping even more. And, and and at some point you just got to get a little real and, and kind of go. I tell you what I've realized, Michael, it hit me last Friday because it was Friday afternoon. I'm, I'm wiped everything for the week weekend. And I realized I feel exhausted. Mm-hmm. And I don't feel exhausted now. And I don't feel exhausted when I'm with my clients. And I don't feel exhausted when I'm brainstorming and creating new ideas. But the moment I switch off, it suddenly hits me. Yeah. And, and the metaphor I've been using, it's like there's two tanks on my back. Um, one tank for energy goes up and down. If, if I'm with someone, I'm creating. If I'm serving somebody, it, it goes back up. You know, help us high. That tank over here goes back up when I'm in service. But this one slowly goes down. And unless I take real time to take care of me, I don't notice. I'm only paying attention to this one. And at some point, this one gets so low, I'm yeah. burnt out and I'm done for. And, and that's been my case. I've been in that position over the years and not noticed. And now I put much more attention on that. Right. But I don't always see it. Like I say, it struck me on the weekend. Oh, my God, I'm exhausted. Yeah. And I only know it because I've stopped. Well, I always remember, I don't know if you remember, did you do that first course with Bill Cumming? That, that, I, I, I did that together, right? Yeah. So the story of his, I always remember, was him talking about March Canute, the teacher who went out to work at Mother Teresa's home for the dying. And she'd, she'd gone through the day and night riding trains and just overheated and got there hoping to kind of get a cold shower or something yeah. and sleep for 24 hours before. And she just got there as the day was beginning and there were lines of people lining up to die. Mm-hmm. And, and she just, her heart went out. And the first guy she came across, he, his leg was snapped to the point where the bone was sticking out. And she, she had a little bit of nursing training and she just kind of knew he, he, he's got no time. And she just, she didn't know what to do. So she just held him. And he kept saying to her, namaste, 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 which she didn't know what that was. But, and, and he died and she went to the next person and she'd been doing it for like six hours before somebody noticed she was there and went, who are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm Mars and, and they made her go to bed. Like they made her come in, yeah. stop yeah, and, and fresh start. Cause they knew, yeah, you can run on, I like the phrase helpers high for a while, but it's not sustainable. Yeah. And, and then the story that Bill used to tell so beautifully is he probably still does um, was, was, you know, the next morning it occurred to her to ask somebody what namaste meant. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, you know, that translation, I, I honor the place in you in which the entire universe resides. I honor the place in you of love, of truth, of light, and of peace. 
And when you are in that place in you and I am in that place in me, there's only one of us. Mm. And I just think this time, especially for me, I feel that more than I normally feel that. Mm. I, 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 I have much less us and them yeah. than, than I normally have and yeah. just a lot more us. Yeah. I mean, it's challenging times. It brings that out um, in, in all of us. I, mean, God, I think of my parents living through the blitz in London. Uh, they tell stories like that. Um, and we're seeing it now. Uh, I, I, it's sad that it takes disaster and struggle to have us feel that connected. Yeah. But there's, there's truth in that. We forget that we get complacent. Life gets fun and easy. And then we, we, we're not, not interested in helping others. Oh, I remember. And it is, it is interesting how it often takes something. And I think it's just anything dramatic enough to interrupt our habits. Yeah. Our habitual ways of showing up and our habitual ways of interacting. The one I remember most from when I was living in London was when, um, when princess Diana was killed in the car crash. And I remember it because my daughter Clara was born that, that the same time. We think maybe she's a reincarnated spirit. I don't know. I don't know quite the timing. But but I remember the funeral was televised. And and after the funeral, we 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 all watched it in our house and we went out into the street to just get some air. There were hundreds of people pouring out of their homes into the street. It was like a street party. And there was just such a sweet feeling of connection. Um, and I think that I, I always think, well, that's how actually this could be if we weren't so habituated yeah. to the ways that we interact. That's one of the gifts of this. Again, I, I said last, last time I did one of these, it's not a gift because I wouldn't give it to my kids, Yeah, but there are gifts in it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do, do you remember the book Stumbling on Happiness? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a beautiful book. book about these moments in life where, where you wouldn't wish them on anybody, but most people who've been through, real struggle, everything from divorce to losing a loved one to health crises, when they look back, they find meaning in that and they use that to create the next part of their life. And so, you know, we'll be at a choice point where we get to choose how we show up now and then what meaning we make of this into our future and, and the lessons, you know, the, 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 I think the biggest gift I can give my kids is not whether or not I do the homeschooling. You know, I, frankly, I could care less whether I'm actually what I'm teaching them right now. It's it's how I'm showing up, what I'm, who I'm being, that I know they're watching. In every moment, they're watching, and which is a bit of pressure sometimes. But well, but no, I remember when my dad died, um, and he died shortly before Nina got pregnant with Oliver. So like it was. Hey, Michael, sorry to interrupt. Your your hand is knocking the microphone, just so you know, oh. a couple of times on the table or something. I get excited. Yeah, 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 I can feel it. Uh, so, so I remember when Nina was pregnant, thinking, "Oh God, I, I'm going to have to teach this kid. What did I learn from my dad?" And I remembered realizing that I couldn't remember a single thing my dad taught me, but I absolutely knew that most of how I showed up in the world was a result of just watching him because yeah. he was really good. At, at showing up. He was really yeah. good with people. He was really kind. He was good at business. He was, and, and I thought, oh, okay. So all I have to do is become a behavioral example of everything I want my kids to be. <laughs> I've got <laughs> nine months. Go. <laughs> and fortunately, I didn't really only have nine months, yeah. but, but it feels like that sometimes. Now, do, do you find that that same thing is a fact, you know, that is obvious in parenting is, is true of leadership at all levels? That that model really, effect. Uh, yeah, that's actually, actually that's a great example. Uh, I had to do the leap then, but no, it's, it's that, exactly the same thing. Leadership is about: are you walking your talk, um, or are you talking your walk? Uh, you, you know, uh, I I come from a background of education, and and I taught in inner city London, where we had kids who came from some of the most the poorest communities in the UK, who went off to Oxford and Cambridge, and others who had parents who were incredibly wealthy and successful, and end up living on the streets. So it, it, it's, it's who you be when you show up as a leader that, that really counts, just as it does in parenting. Mm. Um, and that goes back to where we started earlier, this conversation around uh, challenging times are an amplifier for leaders. Yeah. So, so it, 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 all the work you've done on yourself until now is what's going to have you show up uh, yeah. and how you're going to show up. So what if somebody, what, what's your, like, like, you must occasionally at least get a client who's just in total overwhelm. Like we, there's one guy I was working with who 
his his business, and it's a huge business. Many he's got something like forty companies um, under his group, mm -hmm. but they're all restaurants, bars, and music venues. Yeah, and and you know it was just utter panic at first. Do, yeah. do you have a sort of a a a, a take on be best practices for panic? Well, I'll give you, I'll make it real. So I had um, I got on a call with somebody the other day and I said, how are you doing? I mean, it's my favorite question right now because it allows people just in, for a moment to share, to get it all out. And, and it's easy as a coach to say, okay, let's, let's move on from that. But actually I give people a lot more time to say, to answer that question these days. And he talked a lot about his elderly mother who's really worried about and what's going on in his life. And he just had so much going on up here. I gave him some space and he dropped down. The thoughts drifted away and he dropped down a little bit into his body. And I said, well, what should we do today? What should we talk about? And he started talking about his business and he runs, not as many as your guy, he runs a number of businesses, uh, he's all sorts of successes he's had in the past. And we just started playing. I said, well, just tell me about one of them. Tell me about one of the challenges you have right now. Mm -hmm. And we put two people's attention on one challenge. And then we, he started to see some possibility. And, and he relaxed and said, oh, that was fantastic. Can we look at another business? Sure, let's play. And in that moment, once I'd given him space to, to get present, because I think that's the challenge, of course. I mean, it's always the challenge, right? It, 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 from the present moment, there's never a problem. Or there's always a conversation that can be had, but we're not living in the present. We're in our fears about the future and what might happen, or we're caught in our thoughts about the past, about how we're supposed to show up. And, or our limiting beliefs and so on. So bringing someone back into the, into a conversation like this, we both get present, and from there we can do what needs to be done, or or ideas pop that couldn't have been seen a moment before. Yeah, no, I I definitely that that coming present is it's a game changer. Yeah, it, it it's it's just funny because it's such a cliche, mm -hmm. but yet it's it's a cliche because there's a lot of truth in it. Yeah. We're pretty amazing in the present. We got a question from Rasmic. Michael, Rich, what do you guys think of the future of coaching as a field? What would be the most demanded skills within coaching and what would be the best way to promote it as a field, especially in environments where people are not so used to it? Let's stick to the first bit. Yeah. What do you guys think of the future of coaching as a field? What, what do us guys think of, <laughs> what do you think of the future of coaching? Do you have a sense of, of where where the field is is heading for better and for worse? I don't think anything has changed. Uh, I think great leaders have always sought support in different ways and they will continue to do so. Uh, I think coaching had uh, was looked at with a, a bit of either tentativeness or, or actually even uh, you know given a bad rap in the corporate world, but even that's shifted uh, in the last few years. Did you read Trillion Dollar Coach? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fast yeah, yeah. And, and so there's a, there's a reputation now, you know, most high level executives either have had a coach, have one now or are ready to at some point. It's seen as a place for, for uh, how, one of the ways that leaders grow. Um, Actually, I a, sorry to interrupt, but I had a, 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 a client who basically I realized partway through our engagement hired me like one of those little dogs that Paris Hilton used to carry around because as an accessory. You know, because because it was like, and this is my coach, and this is my puppy, and this is my. Yeah. And it was like that's hopefully not the whole future of coaching. <laughs> I can build a nice little brand around that. <laughs> um, so, but I but so I think I think that nothing has shifted. Uh, if anything, there'll be some people even right now. So I hired a new coach four weeks ago, and I've been saying this to a lot of uh, coaches I meet. You know, I, are you walking your talk right now? If you're in fear mode and wondering where your next client's going to come from, do you have a coach right now? Do you have support? I realize that, that I haven't had a coach for a few years one-on-one. -on -one. I've been in a business mastermind, other, lots of support. I, I never stopped having support, yeah. but um, I, I needed my own coach. I needed a moment where I could just look someone in the eyes and say, and, and, and we have 30-minute calls and about 15 minutes in, all he's done is let me speak and I've resolved most of the questions myself. Yeah. And then we're usually done in less than 30 minutes. Yeah. No, when I think if I was going to just play with the question, I, I think right now it seems to me coaching is slightly in that place where it's, there's a definite uh, burgeoning coaching field. 
And then there's a whole bunch of other fields that now call themselves coaches because that's how they perceive. If I call myself a coach, I can make more money than if I call myself a therapist or a consultant or this, or that. And so I would see that boom busting. Yeah. And then the genuine coaches will carry on yeah. as if nothing happened and continue to support people. But the field itself might change a bit. Well, uh, you know, I think back when Steve and I wrote The Prosperous Coach, there's a line in there. We did a bit of research and we said that 80% of coaches make $20,000 a year or less. Yeah. And that book was written in 2000 and <laughs> about seven or eight years ago. Rich and I are both eight years old. <laughs> Rich into the gray, really. <laughs> exactly. Um, and I would say now most coach, I'd say 90% of coaches make 10 grand a year or less. Yeah. most coaches it's not a profession for them they don't know how to they have these amazing skills that they get they don't know how to turn it into be, being a professional coach yeah and so uh, that, that's always been the way i'm sure it's similar in other fields so if if you are a great coach if you can really be in service of people in a powerful way and have an impact you don't need to worry about the future of the profession just serve the people in front of you i mean that's the only that's the only answer i'd have to that those big questions i think we can get overwhelmed with if, if you're serving people and they're getting value they're going to call you back or I'm going to tell their friends about you. And, and, and do, you do you know, it's funny because I'm, I'm realizing that what you just said is actually the answer to another question I've been sitting with, which is, you know, what, what would be helpful to somebody who was an employee who is now not an employee. And besides all the great stuff about don't panic, be present as best you can mm -hmm. trust that things will come. There's also that opportunity for service. I have a friend and he, his business died literally quarantine end of business. Yeah. And, and he, 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 he panicked until somebody said to him, uh, you know, I think scaring the shit out of yourself before working on your business plan is probably a lousy idea. <laughs> and, and he was like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so he kind of took a fresh look and he went, what are, now, I'm not saying this is what everyone should do, of course, but it, but this was how his how his wisdom genius processed it was, well, the two things people really need right now and are going to need throughout this are they're going to need support and they're going to need to eat. Hmm. So he, even though he has no background in this, no experience in this at all, just started looking into what it would take to deliver fresh fruit and veg to people. Yeah. And Within a week, he'd, he'd sourced some. First week, he made $5 because he'd forgotten to negotiate the price. <laughs> so it turned out he went there and everything he'd made was spent on the stuff. But then he learned from that. Next time he got more suppliers, found out from the people he was serving, they really liked organic and would pay a premium for it. So he started sourcing organic. And you know he's begun bringing in other people to help him. And this is in the space of a month with no background in running a business, no, no experience, but just being willing to take a fresh look at how can I help? Yeah. And, and it doesn't mean all help has to be monetized, but it, it's nice that it can be. Well, well, all it's always an exchange of value. And if he's doing something that creates value for other people, they're going to want to give value back to him. It's yeah. Often these days, that's, that's money. There's other ways to do that too. But yeah, he's. Fine. I'm. I'm teaching Kaleo, my eight-year-old, about entrepreneurship right now, what it means, and we're reading books about what it takes to be an entrepreneur. So I had. Him, I wanted to think that way at a young age, and so he came into the bedroom the other day and said, "Dad, I made your bed. That will be five dollars." I said, well, "Tell me more. Like, how, what's what do you mean?" He said, "Well, I'm going to charge you five dollars a day to make your bed." I said, "You know, you might. Maybe I'll negotiate with you on that one." But but it's it's the heart of entrepreneurship: create value for somebody, bring a service to them, bring it, bring a product to them, and if it's a value to them. They'll give you money for it. Well, and the adaptability. Mm -hmm. In other words, what is of value to people changes. Michael, let me ask you about that because it's one of the things that's dawned on me. About half of the things that I do now, I wasn't doing 12 months ago. Hmm. And I've realized that, uh, and I don't mean I just created new things in the last few weeks. I mean, over the last 12 months, I've been creating new, new yeah. like, programs and ways to work with people. And I've realized one of the, re one of the reasons that I'm, able to cope best in this moment of uncertainty is I'm constantly creating uncertainty for myself. Mm -hmm. I, I get, I have a low threshold for boredom. I'm always reinventing stuff. And even the intensives that I run for years, 
I've never run the same one twice. I've always done something different every single time. And I, and I think that's a, a really important part of entrepreneurship, actually, that ability to thrive in uncertainty, to live with ambiguity, is that when you can do that for yourself, you're ready when the universe is going to do it. Because it's going to do it to you at some point, somehow. Yeah. It just looks this way right now. Well, it was funny because when you said you were teaching Galeo entrepreneurship, my first thought was, oh, so you've taken away his allowance and having him sleep in the car? Because <laughs> <laughs> that's how it starts. Oh, nice. But but I think that the the if I'm understanding the question, the there's a huge difference between uncertainty and insecurity. Hmm. See, most most people I talk to think they're joined at the hip. That in, uncertainty means insecurity. So we try and avoid uncertainty because it feels icky. But it's not uncertainty that feels icky. It's insecurity that feels icky. Hmm. Un, uh, uncertainty is cool. Uncertainty is possibility. And, and if you dwell in possibility, as Emily Dickinson said, life's really kind of exciting because you're looking for fresh. Yeah. Like you said, you're not looking, how do I repeat this so that I don't have to show up anymore? You're going, how do I keep this fresh? How do I, what, what's different? How does this look differently to me today than it did last time I did it? Yeah. What's, and that stops you from falling prey to the who moved my cheese phenomenon where you keep going down the same alley that used to have cheese in it and just get pissed off at the world that they took your cheese mm -hmm. instead of going, well, there's got to be cheese somewhere in here. Yeah. Um, yeah. That book takes me back. Who moved know, your cheese? So, yeah. this, this whole thing does. So, okay. Last, last, last question from me. If, if uh, Kaleo and Ellington and uh, my God kids, uh, Kai and Ryder, if, if, if there was one thing that we were going to sit down and and say to them about what's going on right now that 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 you think would not just best set them up for the future but 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 kind of set them up for the best of their humanity coming forward hmm. what 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 would the talk be like what would you what would you want to talk to them about because these are kids, by the way, for those of you who don't, who don't know <laughs> Rich's children or my godchildren, you know, they're, they're age range from six to uh, 12. Yeah. Um, it's a bit of a trick question, um, either that or my answers being slippery, but I, it, it goes back to what we were saying earlier about uh, who we're being rather than what we're, we're doing or what we're talking about. Um, I, I don't think there is a talk that we can give to kids like that. It, it is who we're being. That, that, that counts. Um, and I'm checking in with myself in real time. Is, am, I, am I slipping away from the question? Um, but, but I, you know, I try and show my kids. I do. I try. So, okay. Every night at dinner, we sit down, we have a ritual. We've done it for a few years since they were very young and they didn't even understand it. But we ask ourselves these questions. We go around. Uh, what was the best bit of your day? What was the most challenging bit of the day? Uh, what's one thing you're grateful for? And what was one small act of courage that you did today? Hmm. And, and if, if they remembered nothing else but that from our time together, yeah. and every day they sat down and looked at something they'd done that they'd accomplished, they were proud of, looked at something they struggled with in that day, because I want them to know that it's okay to struggle. Every day there should be something you're struggling with. And, and, and sometimes they're tiny things, um, something you're grateful for, and one tiny act of courage, one tiny little step in the direction of something that scares you a little bit. I think they'll have a great life. And, and, and so that's, that's the best answer I can give in this moment. Yeah, no, I like that. That works. that works. You're off the hook. You got away with it. No pressure. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. I just, I'm, I'm realizing I hadn't asked myself the question, but yeah. I think if, if, I think my answer in this moment would be something where I wouldn't expect them to understand it, but it would still be the conversation I'd want to be in. And it would be something along the lines of it. It's not about you and it's all about you mm -hmm. that, you know, our world looks really important to us in the moment. Kaleo's toy on the roof, um, my yeah. business success, you yeah. know, it's, it's somebody else's marriage. I mean, whatever we're going through, it looks like the most important thing in the world, but there's a world way beyond that. And, and remembering that is really helpful because we do really well when it's not all about us. Yeah. But like your two backpacks, two 
jetpack power pack. I forget your what you called them analogy. How you show up, your your self care, your ability to look after yourself and show up at your best as much of the time as you can, mm -hmm. makes all the difference in the world too. Yeah. So I, like I said, I wouldn't expect them to kind of go, Dad, you know you're contradicting yourself, but but it would still be the conversation I think would be really helpful. Nice. Yeah, you, you remind me. My, my friend Sean Stevenson passed away last year. I don't know if you know that. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, uh, Sean, Sean passed last year. Um, so for those of you who, who are watching don't know who Sean was, he, he grew to three feet tall. He, he had brittle bone disease. Um, he, he's one of the smallest people I've ever met and one of the most powerful people I've ever met. Uh, no, he's a force of nature. Yeah, Sean was an amazing, amazing man. Um, and his last, literally his last words, he said to his wife, this isn't happening to me. This is happening for me. And I think that's how we show up in any, chance, any moment when things are challenging. If we are able to say, oh, it's not happening to me. If, if it's happening for me, then, then I have choice. If it's happening to me, I feel at, at, at effect. And I can be in control when it's happening for me. Yeah. God, well, I, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that, but that's a beautiful parting, uh, parting shot. So what do you say? Should we do this again next pandemic? <laughs> nice. It's been nice. a while. <laughs> so on a really important note, I, I've been working on my lockdown haircut and I've got the, the clippers down on the sides and the back, although <laughs> All right. the back, but okay. I'm running out of so You bring this up. I, the first blurb I wrote for this, said, we'll be talking about leadership. We'll talking about how to, <laughs> how to cope with working with your kids at home. And we'll be talking about how Rich is managing his hair. But I thought that would be too much. But since you brought it up. Dude, no, these, are, these are important things in life. I mean, seriously. <laughs> I <completely understand. laughs> All right, my friend. Great to see you, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. If you want to find out more about Rich, go to richlitvin.com. How do they find you on Instagram? Do you have like an Instagram thing? No. No, no. Monique, Monique's Instagram, not me. Yeah. Okay. So just go to richlitvin.com and, uh, and, uh, Thank you, Rich. It's great to see you. Thanks, Michael. For most of human history, it wasn't called coaching. It was called leadership. And it's what I love to do, to coach people, to lead people, and to mess with people's thinking. If you'd like more of this, or if you'd like to learn more about our community of extraordinary top performers, go to richlitvin.com forward slash one insight.